I'm delighted to welcome Joji Pal here. Uh, he's from the University of Michigan School of Information. And I just found out earlier that he's teaching the course that I created a gazillion years ago. <laughs> and it's, it's still, still a solid course. Strong. Good, good. Which is well. Uh, uh, <laughs> 622, I don't know. <laughs> uh, evaluation of systems and this, services. This is how bad it is. That even I'm wondering just now, what is it called except 622? <laughs> <laughs> it's user research, basically. Yeah, you, it's evaluation of systems and services is what it used to be called. Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's called uh, anyway. introduction to user research. <laughs> like that, so. Just we know by number. Yeah. Anyway, um, Georgie has a really interesting history. He has a PhD in city and regional planning from Berkeley. He has a master's in information management and systems from Berkeley. He has a master's in arts in Asian studies and a bachelor's in commerce and economics. Boy, he hit all, all fields, didn't you? <laughs> Excellent. Um, and, but he's in the, area, the LA area um, showing a documentary film. So he's part of a film festival, and uh, we invited him down here. So we're delighted to have him um, talk about how social media is used in politics. It's a very relevant topic. <laughs> Please. All right, well, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, social media in political brand building of Narendra Modi, who is the current Prime Minister of India. Uh, second most followed uh, elected official on social media after Barack Obama. Uh, there are times when I will uh, move in a bit of fast forward on Indian politics. Uh, feel free to stop me at any point, but I'm going to skip over things which I don't think might be immediately relevant to the talk uh, and keep to what uh, the main point that I'm trying to make over here is that of why Narendra Modi or any other politician uh, in a country where the voting population, about something like five or less percent of that population might be on social media, well, why would they invest in social media? That's, that's the first part of the talk. And the second part, uh, which is we look at the data to see what and does and does not work in social media in terms of outreach. And by that, what I mean is if you measure outreach as, say, retweets and favorites of, of uh, Twitter messages, are there specific kinds of messages which have greater resonance? And what, what does that say? So in the first part is how does the technology artifact represent the political actor? And in that, what I want to do is motivate what technology is within a broader aspirational frame in India. And that's going to be the, the, the really the, 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 the setup for my talk is going to be technology and aspiration in India. And the second part is how does one go about building an actual political brand? And in that, what you're going to do is look at specifically what Narendra Modi has done uh, through the years that he's been on social media, specifically at Twitter. But the reason why Twitter is important is that's his central account from which he then uh, manages a bunch of other uh, social media as well. And the second part of it is what does and does not work on social media. And in this, what we look at, what are the kinds of topics that Narendra Modi talks about thematically, and how do these change over time? And of course, what does the public respond to? Now, the first motivation question is social media in the global south, as defined as uh, primarily low and middle income countries. Why would uh, politicians invest in social media in the global south? There are certain regional drivers. So there are countries which uh, might be within low and middle income countries, but have a fairly well developed use of social media in those countries because of wide uh, penetration of internet and so on and so forth. Latin American region would be one such region where most Central American, Latin American region countries have fairly uh, deep use of social media. Consequently, politicians are on social media. Country size is another element. So there are countries which are very large. And by virtue of being large, they have a significant elite which is on social media, which for which you might want to be on social media to appeal to that population. And the third is that of star politicians who might have an independent social media following uh, outside of them being political actors. Imran Khan of Pakistan, a cricket uh, captain, would be one such example. Aung San Suu Kyi of Burma would be another such example. And there are many people like that who come with their own following, and then they go into politics. Uh, then, of course, there's individual drivers of what drives politicians to be on social media. Uh, this is Muhammadu Buhari of, um, of Nigeria. 
uh, formerly a military strongman who led a coup, now is very active on social media and has a very different projected image on social media as, as an inclusive leader. So in this, you're doing various things like some form of elite affiliation. So by being on social media, you affiliate with those others within your political constituents who are on, who are in uh, that political elite. There is a form of signaling that how you represent yourself on social media matters, and then that presents you as a different politician, especially as you were once seen as somebody, somebody else. And finally, there is the element of media logic, which is uh, the gap between what the media wants to cover about a political actor and whether that drives the media coverage or what the politician wants covered and whether that drives the media coverage. So it's a question of like on one end of the spectrum, the media does whatever the politician wants them to do. The other end of the spectrum, the politician does what the media wants them to do, right? So, they, so now, and, and I will discuss why each of these are, are specifically relevant to Narendra Modi's own case. So there is the various countries. Uh, we looked through the list of what the World Bank lists as countries in low and middle income countries around the world. And we came across 38 countries where uh, there were two or more leaders, one uh, head of government and one person in the opposition who had 100,000 or more uh, followers on social media. Of those 14 countries, at least, which we could come up with, had a million plus both, uh, both uh, major players. So, so this is not a small phenomenon by any stretch at this point. Various countries are investing in it. If you see some of these patterns are clear over here, there are some of the slightly wealthier countries, a lot of Latin American countries, countries like Turkey, Malaysia, which are generally wealthier, very high use of social media. But then there are others which are uh, generally poorer. Uh, Cambodia, for instance, has a very high social media use among both its, its major politicians. And then, of course, countries like India, Ghana, and Kenya, uh, which have significant, uh, uh, a significant share of elite who are using social media, and that's become a driver for politicians wanting to be on social media. So I'm going to back up here for a second to look at the notion of technology and development broadly and how this fits into technology and development. So these kinds of images of a person using technology that you would not otherwise place with technology have been permeating popular discourse of technology and development for much of two decades over here. Is that a person using a technology in Africa often is seen as something of an anomaly and therefore it might, it, that therefore it's projected as indicating some form of development. A large part of this has been drawn by the fact that Bill Gates, for one, went into uh, development business for much of the last two decades, Bono as well. Do people recognize this guy anymore? Nobody? Michael Dell. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. One, at one point, his picture was worth enough to put up there, and then people say, oh, that's Michael Dell. But that is Michael Dell right now. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, so, so, so this, this idea of technology and development has also extended to political actors who have frequently over time been uh, being seen alongside computers, right? So then being affiliated with the computers of Robert Mugabe with his computer projects, giving away computers to various people. There's, of course, Muhammadu Buhari. I'm not sure if this necessarily shows him in a good light, but nonetheless, it's a picture <laughs> of him with an Apple computer. Paul Kagame of Rwanda, very major player in the whole technology and development space, did the major one laptop per child project, which in and of itself was a very important uh, ICT for development uh, project. And of course, there was a Japanese politician who would come on TV and do these uh, speed computer assembly things. His, 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 his claim to fame as a technocrat was uh, this guy who did this. And of course, you have this uh, in India, specifically uh, various politicians trying to, in some way, affiliate themselves with technology. I mean, arguably, this starts way back in Indian history with the notion of technology more broadly. But when we are talking about digital technology and computers, uh, there is uh, one of the big things which has been common in India is the quest for the cheapest computer. And various politicians over the last uh, two decades have come up with 
support for projects which claim to make the cheapest computers, which hasn't really happened, but politicians posing with this has happened. Whenever Bill Gates shows up in India, he gets a bunch of people to shake hands with him and take pictures. Uh, our <laughs> former president was somebody who, uh, who was known as a, te as a technocrat. Uh, and of course, there was this particular politician, this guy actually worked for him several years ago, and uh, his, his, his trademark was, uh, was also posing with computers, often with one finger at least daintily placed on a keyboard. Uh, so this, this, this idea of technology as having some kind of political cachet has been true in India for much of these two decades. And one way in which we've seen this is in computer giveaways, politicians posing with children to who they were giving away computers. Uh, one of my favorite cases was this one politician in South India uh, who did this computer giveaway in which his uh, image was uh, part of the, uh, um, the wallpaper. Uh, it was given to children with the news crews and all that. And then the kids were asked to then parade those computers on the streets so that everybody could see. Of course, that didn't work out quite as well because of the glare from the sunshine. So his, uh, his immediate opponent then came up with the idea of just emblazoning her picture onto the screen so you couldn't actually get rid of it. Uh, and then yet another politician there then had his own picture and his father's picture put on the wallpaper, and if you tried to get rid of it, the computer would stop working. So, so, so and, and another example of how this has become so common in the Indian political space is this one clip I will show you of a political anthem for a state in South India. And, and I'll let the clip ex actually explain itself. Oh. Wrong setting. Okay, so this is a state political anthem. I mean, uh, anthems, typically the picturization of anthems will have your standard grassy knolls and cows and <laughs> nice buildings, etc., etc. So let's take a look at what happens of this one. <laughs> It's, it's supposed to be progressive. It's trying to show the state in a certain light. It has some of the other elements of, of an anthem, you know, all the famous people, there is the lovely beach and all that. The woman, sorry, technology and language. So then, so then, so then the, the, it, the language of that state is online. It, it speaks of that language as in we can now work in this language on, on, on the internet. But more importantly, the woman, when she comes into the building, mm -hmm. it is a tall glass structure, and she looks at it in a specific way that would seem that this is not the building that she normally walks into. Yeah. It's new. Right? It's new for her. It's new for her. So it is within an aspirational frame, which she couldn't have been part of back in the day, but now she is part of that. Also, symbolically, she shakes hands with the man, mm -hmm. right? And this, of course, you'd need to know a little bit about the way uh, gender relations are constructed. But she does that, and then she sees that there's a kind of body language 
in the confidence that she finds when she's sitting in front of the computer. So all of these being part of what is projected as a state national anthem, when they can choose the other various things, they decide to focus on this, is, says something in and of itself. What is also interesting to me is the way cinema incorporates uh, technology and technology work. So, so try to think of the last Hollywood movie you saw in which the software engineer was the aspirational hero. I don't know. It was, it was for, for some reason, when I ask this question, people like hark back to Matthew Broderick <laughs> from 30 years ago or something. There's it, it, been nothing since then. But the point is that in Indian, South Indian movies in particular, the software engineer, the male lead character's role as a software engineer has become increasingly common, as though that is an accepted standard major aspirational thing to, 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 to buy for. More importantly, female characters as playing software engineers is also very common. And that is, is important in other ways because women in, in, in South Indian films specifically didn't have jobs. I mean, if they had a job in an office space, then a man had failed somewhere, which is why it requires her to have a job. <laughs> but that this is now shown as part of an acceptable thing in which the woman is safe and she does not deviate from what is the, the, the marked track for being for successful womanhood in, 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 in Indian, in Indian um, society. I, li I like that if you, if you got the software engineering job, you could maybe, <laughs> I, I think you could at least afford the shirt uh, and, and the hair and uh, maybe the bed on the ocean or wherever this is and the and mimosa, etc. <laughs> Sorry? And Photoshop. And Photoshop. Oh, really? Yes. I mean, come on, you don't have to spoil it for me. <laughs> so, I'm going to move from setting up what is technology in India today to uh, a little bit about Narendra Modi and where he comes from uh, before talking about what, where technology fits into what he's trying to do online. So, Narendra Modi is a politician who has his origins in a social movement referred to as the RSS. These are the pictures out here on the left uh, with these uh, men in these white shirts and khaki shorts. And the RSS is a social movement which has a political wing known as the BJP. And the social movement is, uh, I'm summarizing in one sentence, uh, is based on an idea of building a, a society in India based on Hindu values, right? And the BJP is its political wing, also traditionally seen as a social conservative right-wing party. Okay, Narendra Modi was also known as a political strongman for that party. One of his trademarks was before speeches, typically before he went up and gave a speech, he would be handed a sword. So, so the idea, therefore, was that he was the protector of the Hindu society within that state where he was a politician. Now, he was the chief minister of a straight state called Gujarat, which is in the west of India. And he was the chief minister from 2001 up until 2014 when he became prime minister. And uh, an important part of his political imaging came in 2002 when there were major riots in the state. And those riots, he was largely seen as having been complicit in those riots by the mainstream media, especially the elite English language media. And uh, part of it was that he was indicted in the Supreme Court, uh, in, 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 uh, he was indicted for the riots, never convicted, but that there was people who worked in his cabinet who were convicted for their involvement in the riots. So, the point is that in 2002-2003, the image of this politician in the news is one of being a Hindu strongman, belonging to a social conservative movement, and who has with him that uh, the additional element of having been part of these riots. What I will do now is show you an important clip of a television interview. Mr. Modi, please. Which, uh, which he did in 2007. This is five years after the riots. 
And by this point, Modi has invested significantly in moving away from the association of the riots to an association with development for his state. But my point of bringing out the CNN interview is to show where the mainstream media wants to frame him. Start by talking about you. In the six years that you've been Chief Minister of Gujarat, the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation has declared Gujarat to be the best administered state. India today, on two separate occasions, has declared that you are the most efficient Chief Minister. And yet, despite that, people still call you to your face a mass murderer, and they accuse you of being prejudiced against Muslims. Do you have an image problem? I think it's not uh, proper to say that people. There are two or three persons, those who used to talk in this terminology. And I always say, God bless them. You are saying this is a conspiracy of two, three people only? I am not saying so. But you are saying it's only two, three people? This is what I have in This is not the people's point. Can I point out to you that in September 2003, the Supreme Court said they had lost faith in the Gujarat government. In April 2004, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in open court said that you were like a modern day Nero who looks the other side when helpless children and innocent women are gone. The Supreme Court seems to have a problem with you. Correct. I am not this person. Please go to the Supreme Court judgment. And if there is anything in there, I will be happy to know everything. It wasn't in writing, you're absolutely right. It, it was an observation. Judgment. It is an observation. If it is in judgment, then I'm, I'm I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to give you the answer. I tell you what the problem is. Even five years after the Gujarat killings of 2002, the ghost of Godra still haunts you. Why have you not done more to allay that ghost? This I gave it to the media persons like Karan Thapar. Let them go. Let them enjoy. Can I suggest something to you? I have no problem. Why can't you say that you regret the killings that happened? Why can't you say that what? maybe the government should have done more to protect the Muslims? What I have to say, I have said at that time. And you can find out the magistrate time. To say it again? Not necessarily. I have to talk about the 2007 everything, what you want to tell. But by not saying it again, by not letting people hear the message repeatedly, you are allowing an image that is contrary to the interest of Gujarat to continue. It's in your hands to change it. I'm out of the list. All right. So he gets up and leaves, and this interview sort of ends there. So it's a pretty. I've, I've seen this 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 interview by now about a hundred times, and every time I watch it, it's equally uncomfortable to watch because of the the nature of the tension that's going on in this interview. And it's worth noting that for several years after this interview, he did not do any television interviews. All right. So, 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 so my point of starting here is that this is a person who has, at this point, a significant problem with one section of the media, especially the mainstream English language elite media, with which he's having these negative interactions, where the conversation keeps getting pulled back to one topic which he does not want to talk about, he wants to move on to other topics. So how does that politician then move from there to managing their media in a different way? And that's the setup for why Narendra Modi first gets on social media, and more specifically, what he does once he's on it. So the research has looked at about, well, at this point, about 6,000 tweets between February 2009 and 2015, October. And uh, we basically <coughs> categorize each tweet in one of 13 different categories, a uh, greeting, an update, a confrontation, et cetera, et cetera. And there are up to three themes attached to every, uh, specific, uh, uh, every specific tweet. This is a kind of long-tailed uh, themes. So they could be about politics, they could be about cricket, they could be about a specific uh, scheme that he has going at this 
uh, at a given point of time. Each theme also has a regional categorization as he's speaking about some part of India, some part of the world. We look at whether themes have call outs uh, to other people on social media, are there links or media in them? And we've broken them up into 12 blocks, each of them around key phases. Now, we are not going to look at all 12 blocks in this, in this talk. In this talk, what I'm going to do is more talk about why he's on social media, how he's managed to create a political brand on social media, and only look at the distinction between two blocks. One is pre-election, and one is post-election as prime minister. Okay, the first thing I want to point out is the way that his growth has happened on social media. What we've done over here is ignore the lower line. The, the upper line is the median retweets for a given month and the median uh, favorites for a given month on his Twitter account. This is a log scale. So uh, the early part of this is not that relevant because the, the tweeting was somewhat uh, sporadic. And the number of followers also mapped along over here. And as you see that this one keeps growing uh, gradually until September 2013, which is when it starts growing much more, uh, much more uh, significantly. Till at this point, there's about 19 million followers. Uh, if we look at the line of the median retweets and the median favorites, there is just one thing I want to point out over here, which is that celebrity accounts typically have more favorites than retweets. Okay, and the logic behind this is that when you favorite something, it's just like saying you like something. When you're retweeting something, it's like you're actively propagating that message. In Modi's case, as might be true for many politicians, the retweet rate remains consistently significantly higher than the favorite rate until he becomes prime minister. And at the time that he becomes prime minister, his account started behaving more like a standard celebrity account, right? But also important that oh, till, till this point, if you look at the amount of activity in terms of retweeting, it's very significant given the number of actual followers. Whereas over here, the retweeting actually sort of, it, it still has momentum, but isn't growing quite as fast. Okay. The important point about this is that till the point that he actually becomes prime minister, there is an active interest by those who are his followers to push the message outwards. Again, not something that should surprise anybody. I mean, there's an election in place, but at least we are able to see how this happens and that exactly after he gets elected, that pattern changes. What I'm going to do now is talk about exactly how he uh, creates a social media brand. The first point is about how he creates a ubiquitous uh, presence on various kinds of social media, what kind of crafted messaging uh, he uses, crafted messaging as opposed to some kind of casual messaging. You might be sitting here in the room and saying, there's this guy droning on and on, and that's, that's your casual social media messaging. What kinds of specific and often visual techniques of rebranding, and the use of celebrities in the tweeting, as well as followbacks, which is the reciprocity when somebody follows you and you follow them back. So, LinkedIn. The Prime Minister of India is on LinkedIn. <laughs> so you might wonder, LinkedIn might tell you, well, what might be the next job you might be good for? <laughs> so, well, you've done with Prime Minister of India, maybe it's time for you to move on to Pakistan. <laughs> but there's something really important about why Narendra Modi would have a LinkedIn account. Because his persona is built on a kind of, of I'm standing on my qualifications. There's this sense that I am like the rest of India, especially young India, who are creating their LinkedIn pages, putting in their education, their summaries of each and everything. So below this, there is a summary of his achievements as the chief minister of Gujarat, and so on and so forth. So in this, he's the I am self-representing like the other young people of the country. Instagram. Facebook, he has uh, in excess of 36 million at this point. Pinterest boards. He's even on YouTube. And what's very interesting about his YouTube channel is that in the YouTube channel, he has also speeches which he does on radio. So he does radio speeches which reach a wider, uh, a wider audience of 
uh, Indians who don't have access to traditional media. And for them, he has speeches which are then uh, li linked to his YouTube account. And what's also interesting about the YouTube account is that uh, he gives, gives speeches which are not just political, but about generally managing your life in different ways. So how to do stress management. In addition to this, there is also a bunch of yoga poses which you can learn from his YouTube account. The message here is that this is a person who doesn't just stand for a political vision, but is an all-round leader who has various things to offer you in addition to whatever his political vision is. He even is on Google Plus with uh, in excess of 2 million people in his circles, which I think might be the entire universe of people on Google Plus. <laughs> Followbacks is something that the Obama campaign used very effectively back in the day uh, when you would follow Obama and then they would give you a followback. And Narendra Modi also uses followbacks. But I'd like to break followbacks, follows rather from a politician into two, two uh, basic categories. One is when you follow someone where the value of following that person is showing that you follow that person. Okay. So if you follow, when Narendra Modi followed people like the Indian cricket captain, a very famous musician, so there is a representational value in saying that, well, these are the kinds of people I'm kind of affiliating one-on-one -on -one with, especially if I'm a, 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 a politician who represents a pan-Indian kind of vision. But he also follows people who symbolize some kind of pros, uh, progress. So Eric Schmidt and Bill Gates. So it's like saying, well, I have my ear is tuned to what those people are saying. However, there is a common person follow 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 back that he does of lay people who are not famous for any particular reason, as far as one can tell. And a lot of those followbacks came on his birthday in September 2013. So Imagine this: you are you wake up one morning and uh, your 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 social media account says, "I'm followed by Tom, Roger, and Narendra Modi <laughs> today," and it's a shock, especially if you've been out there propagating the person's message, sending out his emails to every all and sundry, and then you find out that there is that somebody in his campaign has sought out who are the people who are retweeting his messages and they followed you back. So it's like an exceptional tap to the back from your leader. And one of the things that happens is that you change your image to saying that now my personal profile, my personal identity is part of Narendra Modi. You might even change your profile text to say that I am an engineer, I uh, uh, live in uh, Irvine, and I'm followed by Narendra Modi. Right? And we actually see this among a lot of the people who got followed by Narendra Modi, who then went out there on that day and, and made pledges. I mean, obviously, you don't have a way of telling whether these pledges were put to place or not, of saying that, yes, thank you for following me, and I will do what I can to, to bring out your vision of getting this number of uh, electoral uh, seats. At the time, uh, right, uh, at the time going into the 2014 election, now remember, so this is September 2013 is when he does all these follows. This is just one part of various things that he's doing, and the election is in May 2014. So in the upcoming, uh, in uh, around April 2014, we did a look at how much his average messages were getting retweeted versus, say, Obama's. And his average messages were getting retweeted three times as much as Obama's, even though at that time he had one-ninth as many followers as, as Obama at that point. Now, obviously, he's going into an election cycle. There are more people interested in retweeting his messages. But the point is that he was running a fairly effective campaign, even if there were a certain number of bots out there uh, working on his behalf. The second thing he's done very, very carefully is use of celebrity affiliations. And along with celebrity affiliations, a sort of tech affiliation, the first major Google Plus Hangout by a, 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 a major national politician in India was Narendra Modi. So the moment it came out, he said, well, I'll do a hangout. And when he did it, he did it with an action film star who had just finished making this big blockbuster. So he used that star uh, in doing his, his hangout. What he also did was take pictures with film stars in 
as the election was coming uh, in the uh, uh, just months before the election this is a picture with a south indian film star and if you look down here 2.3 million people liked the picture right after it was posted so so there's a way of tapping then into the following of someone else who also has their own following uh, another tactic used by uh, Modi with uh, specific regard to celebrity accounts is uh, adding people to something that he's trying to do. So in this case, uh, you see this tweet says, I am pleased to invite the following to join Clean India campaign. That's his campaign. Mridula Sinaji at Sachin RT, which is the Indian cricket player, at Yog Sri Ramdev, another uh, uh, guru, and at Shashi Tharoor, another politician. So he is now publicly calling on them to do something. And of course, now this politician over here feels embarrassed and all oh, now, now, now the prime minister asked me to do something. So he sends a sheepish message saying, honored to accept the, the, the invitation. I'm currently in Bucharest doing something or the other. But the moment I come back, I'm going to start cleaning India. <laughs> what he also does here, and this is a little bit harder to catch, but he shows some kind of expertise, which is really interesting in uh, this case. So I'll have to explain this to you. Good luck at Y Umesh. This is Umesh Yadav. He's a cricket player. Bowl out the batsman with your impressive speed and reverse swing. This and uh, the other one over here, young Akshar Patel can trick the batsman with a sharp spin and bounce. Give your best and play without pressure. This player is remarkably bad under pressure. Okay? And this guy, he's giving very specific knowledge which to know that that kind of specificity or cricket, you'd either have to be watching it quite significantly, or at least it's showing some sense of expertise that this guy really knows what he's talking about about cricket. But if you were to go back a couple of years to how he talked about, and of course, you know, in each case, this guy is like, oh, the prime minister just told me to, to play properly, so thank you, sir, I salute you, and I promise that I will do my best. But a few years ago, he said, nice meeting noted cricketer Sri Kapil Dev. I can't explain the, uh, easily how funny this sounds. It's like saying, nice meeting noted basketball player Michael Jordan. <laughs> so the, the sophistication with which he speaks about sport changes dramatically from early in his campaign when presumably nobody is telling him, well, you know, this is this is Kapil Dev. You don't have to say noted cricketer Sri Kapil Dev. You just say Kapil Dev. Oh, yeah, it's Kapil Dev. Right. Whereas over here, now he's a very different person in terms of the sophistication. He also uh, was very effective at using retweet. I actually like this picture just because of the irony over here. This is the Clean India campaign with Narendra Modi started and basically getting uh, largely celebrities to sweep the streets to, uh, so people wouldn't start throwing dirt. Uh, there's, there's this guy who is a film star who has his hand in a cast. So I'm not sure what sweeping he's doing, but he seems to be at least supervising people who are doing some kind of sweeping. <laughs> and his tweet here says, I started cleaning my own surroundings and learned so much. <laughs> Started with my lens and Jew is almost like an, a, 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 a like a quasi embarrassing tweet, but nonetheless, <laughs> at the point when Narendra Modi retweets it, then the tweet goes get, goes viral. He was also good about using religious uh, uh, celebrities. Uh, this 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 uh, so in in these cases he's using two specific celebrities who are uh, sort of gurus with their own following and cults. And in both cases, there is some amount of overlap between their followings and, and his. He uses a sort of affiliative casual language. If you look at this exchange with Mike mm -hmm. Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg says, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and I share uh, the belief that cities are the key to driving innovation and progress. Narendra Modi replies, my friend Mike Bloomberg and I had a great meeting. Right? So, so there is this use of affiliative language. Likewise, when Barack Obama came to India, he always referred to him as my friend Barack. He did not say President Obama. So there is that kind of affiliative language. Again, this is another picture which I really love, which is, was great meeting you, Bill Gates. Got to spend time talking to you during the meeting with President Hollande. The, the, the language of the tweet is almost to remind Bill Gates that, hey, you remember you met me? As Bill Gates would forget. But the point more importantly is that right after this tweet came out, 
Bill Gates sent a reply saying, hey, thanks, Narendra Modi, for remembering that we met and all that. And there is that then thread that this is Modi who is on a one-on-one -on -one with Bill Gates. He's going out there and hugging Mark Zuckerberg and having those kinds of conversations. Now, when the Twitter account was first started, it came on Facebook, it started as Namo League is a network of fans of Narendra Modi. At that point, the language is third person. But within the first year, the language changes from third person to direct conversation. So even though everybody knows that there is a, a political machinery behind the tweets, the fact that it comes that one uh, direct appears like there's the leader talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. He uses crafted messaging. In this case, he says infrastructure should not be about highways, but information highways. A lot of use of, 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 of buzzwords. Uh, a great example of some of the tweets which are most highly retweeted are those where he uses political irony. I would imagine that anybody who does not know the Indian political scene very well will make no sense of the first tweet. Shahzada came to Rajasthan without informing their CM and rode on a bike belonging to a history sheeter. Perhaps he was inspired by the tweet. <laughs> So yeah, you guys are laughing, right? So you're insiders to this joke, but this is a brilliant tweet and I will break it down for you. Doom 3 is like the Indian version of Fast and Furious 10 or whatever is going on right now, but on motorbikes, right? Shahzada is a reference to his political rival, but he's attacking on two fronts over here. First is he's calling him Shahzada as instead of Rajkumar, which is the Islamic term instead of the Hindu term, as if to imply that this is somebody who's coming from outside. And by calling him a princeling, he suggests that that person is who he is, not because he deserves to be there, but because of what his lineage is. Came to Rajasthan, that's a state in India, without informing their CM, governor, the guy has no, clearly no regard for law, rode on a bike belonging to a history sheeter. A history sheeter is a career criminal. Perhaps he was inspired by Dhum 3. At one shot, he says all these things and points out that he's up on popular culture. Right? So he uses various kinds of such quips in poli of political irony aimed at his political rivals, but in a way which is very typical in Indian uh, electoral uh, campaigning where joke writers and people who write little slogans are hired to come up with these quips for when you're doing street campaigning. So you're going out on the streets, say one, two, three, four, who are we all rooting for? That kind of stuff. But now, taking that and immediately transferring it onto an online space. He uses a number of buzzwords. Sometimes they kind of come across as a little bit funny, but they are, they are quite effective in the retweet counts. Governments rule, governance delivers. Government is about file, governance is about life. I describe India Bhutan as B for B, Bharat for Bhutan instead of B2B. So this use of alliterations and various kinds of buzzwords is also something we find very commonly. Uh, <coughs> The typical political tw uh, Twitter uh, action is often around things like self-proportion, which is a politician talking about what great stuff they've done, some kind of ritual responses to events, politicians saying greetings to the people of LA on having four or five back now that Obama's gone, or as well as uh, some kind of confr confrontation where the politician actually confronts their political rival. Uh, in Modi's case, he very rarely uses any kind of confrontation, especially post-election. And he's, by and large, the majority of his messages tend to be positive messages. And when there is a confrontational situation involved, often it's the people in his second line who deal with the confrontations, not he himself. And this confrontation is, uh, comes through a much more complicated uh, set of second layer of people who often troll uh, people who, who, who put out anti-Modi messages, and there are various cases of this happening in the last few years. Uh, 
a visual element of how the rebranding has happened is visible in some of these messages. If you look at these messages, there are various things going on over here. Uh, there is Narendra Modi here. Firstly, this is not the same person, you know, waving around the swords and all that. There's this nice misty morning and uh, lovely serene settings. Uh, he is, is in a meditative pose. Uh, in this image, he has these uh, white birds around him, sort of symbol of peace. Uh, Apple laptop computer, which he's using. Uh, reading the Economic Times, Obama. President Obama's book down here, <laughs> right? And, and, and he's using an SLR camera, man of skill, clearly, right? And, and actually, as, as a middle-aged Indian person, I can also say that he is uh, in exercise outfit, which is very unusual, somebody being middle-aged Indian and trying to respect your body. So he has embodies many things about what is a good, well-rounded politician which come out in the way that these images of him um, are circulated. Uh, at the, uh, during the time of the election, there was also an app for Narendra Modi. There was a Narendra Modi app. And in addition to the Narendra Modi app, there was also a branded laptop, uh, sorry, a branded cell phone with Narendra Modi on it, which you could pick. Perhaps the most interesting thing that he did in the upcoming, uh, in the election was the use of holograms. Yeah. This is Irvine, I guess people remember the Tupac hologram. No, wrong generation. Well, anyways. So Narendra Modi had his holograms which went throughout rural India. There were trucks which went from town to town and they would basically set up this hologram where Narendra Modi would appear and give a speech and take questions. I mean, obviously these questions wouldn't be from uh, all and sundry. But the point is that this notion of a technology savvy uh, prime minister or candidate at the time was not just restricted to those who were gaining access to this on their mobile phones, but it was coming through through things like holograms put out to people uh, in rural India. So what you see is this kind of transformation from this person about 15 years ago to this idea of this tech using uh, social media, but at the same time this notion that this is not necessarily at odds with each other. And this is very, very surprising use of triumph of the will, which is basically building on a, 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 a metaphor used in Nazi Germany for an article, a positive article depicting Narendra Modi. And that came out at the time that he was elected. And, and at the time of his election, he also pulled off w one uh, uh, social media stunt, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, he created a, a, a uh, hashtag called Selfie with Modi, okay? And what would happen is that if you took a picture of yourself and tagged it Selfie with Modi, some, all the pictures with Selfie with Modi would be taken together to create a collage pastiche of the face of Modi. Yeah, remember Truman Show? Yeah. So this is kind of selfie with Modi coming together to become Modi, where each of you is part of Modi. So in doing so, as the leader, you are interacting with the population, but, but it's not clear what effort you put into the actual interaction. But it's a very good use of the affordance of the technology to appear to be interacting. When he won the election, he put out the tweet that India has won. He didn't say that I have won down with my rivals. So we also see that the themes of what he talks about evolved. The two themes that we see most consistently before uh, when he becomes prime minister and after when he becomes prime minister is technology and development. 4% is pretty significant that 4% of all the tweets are about technology in some form or are about development. And this stays pretty consistent. What changes dramatically is talking about foreign affairs. Also something which is pretty uh, reasonable, you would assume that before you become prime minister, there isn't much reason to talk about foreign affairs. But once you do, then that uh, skyrockets. The use of sarcasm or political irony is the one thing that we find really interesting because it actually has a lot of resonance in, in, in peoples. And the use of celebrity callouts is also interesting because before he became prime minister, in part because of the whole uh, discourse surrounding Modi, not a lot of celebrities were willing to be photographed with him. Until the last couple of months, where it became clear that this guy is going to win the election. 
I am at no point claiming that he wins the election because of social media. What we are saying here is that social media is part of an image recreation campaign, which works in this case because of the way that it moves on social media. He's known for this form of selfie diplomacy, often taking pictures with, uh, with international <laughs> diplomats, which, which, which also has a value of giving a certain casualness to international relations. Uh, the two points which we also uh, like to uh, see the uh, point out from the data is that political irony, such as those the, the tweet where he jokes, outperform the median of any given month by over fifty percent before the elections. That's quite significant. So, so it's 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 really when your kind of gloves are off and you're making direct confrontations is when people actually respond to those messages a lot more. Again, might be quite obvious, you say something controversial and people react to it, but this is what has resonance. If you're a political leader thinking about, well, what should I learn from Narendra Modi? What you should learn from Narendra Modi is to cleverly insult your opponents, which actually is interesting. We can talk about Donald Trump later if you want to. <laughs> and also, celebrity call-outs outperform the median by a good 30%. And that also has to do with the fact that now it's not only your uh, followers, but those of the celebrity which also uh, come together. Comes across as a man for all seasons. Right after he won the election, the first thing he did is went and got blessings from his mother. Took a picture of that. At the time, the second most retweeted message in India. But he still has this kind of fist-thumping style of politics. Incredible orator, really uh, uh, fascinating ability to, uh, to control a crowd and tell uh, how the crowd's um, uh, pulse is. And at the same time, of course, he's, he takes pictures with celebrities and, and film stars. So, so this is a person who's able to represent all three at the same time. So in conclusion, what Modi means for social media, our point here is that he has become a bit of a textbook case for political brand management. The important thing is not that there are only two or three or five percent of people in India who use social media. The important thing is that Narendra Modi now does not speak outside of social media. So there is no, there is no system, not only in India but many other countries, where the president has to stand up in front of a group of press and answer their questions. If that is not there, then the only way even the mainstream media gets what you have to say is on your Twitter feed. And on your Twitter feed, you can control your message the way you want to say it and build it around that. And which is where his case of political brand manage is really fascinating for the way that it's, it's been much more crafted. He rarely deals with any controversy. As I said, there are specific cases which we can talk about where significant, uh, uh, there were significant events, rioting and so on and so forth in India, in which his loudest response was being completely quiet. Whereas, uh, likewise, he might comment on much smaller events, such as the Indian cricket team winning some game, where his tweet signals a certain kind of being in touch with the average person. And this is important because the previous prime minister was seen as not being in touch with the younger population of, of India. Uh, we also think that this opens up methodological uh, directions for new studies. How do you look at our, our work has been very human intensive where we look at every tweet and basically have a team of four people look at every single tweet and categorizing it. And each of those four people is quite well versed in, in Indian politics. How do you change from that to a different model of doing things? And of course, uh, for my own uh, my purpose, this is a case for rethinking ICT for D. And ICT for D is this field of technology and development in which for many years we've been trying to think about what technological artifacts change the way the development happens on the ground in various parts of the world. And what we're trying to make an argument for with this study is to say that that's not all that ICT for D is. ICT for D should be looking at how the technological artifact represents aspirations of the people who are targets of that technology. Okay, so I'm open for questions. Do you have any information about the change in composition of the team that's doing this? Yes. So uh, the we don't know the granular information of when individual people changed, but uh, we do know that uh, Modi has hired 
uh, a, an international ad agency, Ogilvy and Mather, to manage his uh, social media. We do know that the BJP party has something called the BJP IT cell, which was managing the uh, campaign in the time, uh, between, definitely in the time uh, in leading up to the 2014 elections, which is probably 2012 onwards. What we see is the biggest difference is the pre-2013 tweets and the post-2013 tweets in terms of the, the, the way the language framing happens. So we assume that there has been some change in the composition in that period. All we know is whatever is officially spoken about when those changes happen is not clear, but we do know that those changes did happen around the 2013 period. Now, it's also important that right after the election, one of uh, uh, two of the major people who were part of this campaign then moved from his campaign to the campaign of yeah. his opposition yeah. person. So then there is this, this, this body of political social media specialists who are very active, often going from one campaign to another. Yes? Um, I was thinking during your talk about the um, maybe irony or contradiction of someone who's like very publicly eloquent in Hindi and formal Hindi and not super comfortable in English, and this very Anglophone um, social media profile. I thought, okay, maybe this just speaks to you know who is using social media in, in India, English medium people. And then there was one tweet um, that you showed that India has one tweet that was the only one that had Hindi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to sort of his or his team's use of language on social media. That's an excellent question, actually. Uh, so the tweets that he sends in Hindi at median significantly outperform the ones that he sends in English. Mm -hmm. But he sends them selectively. Now, there are other Twitter uh, handles which translate his messages and then retweet them and all that. But he generally, the point is so not so much that the Hindi-speaking population is not one that he's trying to appeal to to win elections. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is something which 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 settles him as a different political person than that of whatever his rivals want to think of him as. So the use of English is in and of itself, and, and a very sophisticated Anglophone language is in and of itself very much part of the branding that he's trying to present. And within that, he will very strategically, every month there will be a few tweets always in Hindi. And those tweets are also very crafted. The tweets in Hindi actually are even more crafted than the ones in English. In English, you'll frequently say something like, you know, met the the so-and-so, the minister of Bulgaria today. Great, let's think about future. But the ones in Hindi are often written almost like political one-liners. So. Yeah. Uh, just um, building on his question, actually, I was wondering, because you didn't talk at all about his global appeal, right? Because um, one of the accusations leveled against him has also been that uh, while doing all these exercises, he's really appealing to the diaspora. Yes. And he's not, I mean, you know, this doesn't mean much for a country that doesn't have that kind of internet connectivity. Yes. And I was wondering if you were able to, it would be very interesting if these tweets are also able to sort of locate uh, who is retweeting him or yeah. whether it's, it's within India or outside or something like that. Right, right. So. That's a space we're not going into. We don't study who's retweeting them and, and how. It would be interesting to collaborate on stuff on that. Well, and, and partly, the, the, there isn't a great, great deal of geocoding of the tweets themselves. So you can't tell necessarily. You can tell only a small fraction of them of where they are. I mean, yes, when something is being retweeted a thousand times, then you can presumably get some number of, uh, of people who are retweeting. But that's, that's hard to tell. An important thing about Modi is in uh, the post-2002 Modi was he was banned from entering the United States. Mm -hmm. Very rarely used against politicians to not allow them to, to enter the United States. And the EU had a, uh, had a standing order that no, no uh, bureaucrat above the B2 level or something would interact with Modi. Mm -hmm. okay? So this is a person who is actually officially political pariah as far as, uh, as, far as the, of the, the creation of pariah goes. So, so we have to look at this as something which represents him not only for the elite within India, but as to the elite of the entire world, as, as here is who I am. And, and, and you have to look at 
say Muhammad Buhari's uh, use of social media also on the same terms, or Paul Kagame who's like now a uh, 20 some year dictator of Rwanda also saying that okay you might call me a dictator but look at this this is me with a political vision and so on and so forth doesn't matter if the people of Rwanda are voting for him or not what matters is that this is a public image for the larger world which emerges out of this this positioning so yes Narendra Modi is hugely popular in the United States especially in California by the way right and there's the, the that's a huge conversation which which I can't have right now on why that is so but it is because that there is a certain upper class upper caste Indian population in the US and one which often believes that it has made it on its own which is a big part of Narendra Modi's discourse as being somebody who has made it on his own starting from somebody who was selling tea on the on in a train platform to now being the prime minister of the country so this sense of being self-made as an american ethic goes very well with narendra modi's positioning politically yes please um, i guess i'm oh. like oh, sorry. go ahead go ahead i'm, I'm kind of uh like confused about like, how these all relate to each other so it sounds like when you're looking at his tweets, he's talking to the people of India mostly. Like he's talking about their celebrities and all that, and people who are from India like get the jokes and stuff like that. But like in the beginning of the talk, you're talking about how like CNN interviewed him. That was just like really embarrassing. Yeah, um, that was CNN in India. CNN in India. Okay, yeah. so people from India are watching. Yeah. Yes. But um, I guess like it sounds like you're talking a lot about like the broader view of him in the world, and and, and among the Indian elite. And among the Indian elite. <laughs> yeah. Like, how does he actually manage to turn, like, from being like a pariah, like in the, like in the world, not in India, to like, is that because of his social media and because he was elected, or like a combination of things? Or? Yes, that's a good question. So, so let me then <coughs> break the being elected from the social media. He would have been elected even if he didn't have a social media account. This election was set up in such a way that there was an anti-incumbency that Congress, the, the, Cong the government which was there in place before Narendra Modi was destined to fail. Now, the question is who is going to replace it? Narendra Modi's party was the most obvious party to replace it. Narendra Modi himself was the strongest leader within the party. He would have probably ascended to being the head of that party long before had it not been for the stain of the riots yeah. and of what came with it. This has to be seen as an effort to undo that stain and to create a new persona. That's what we're trying to say over here. And to undo that stain, one of the first populations you have to appeal to is the elite Indian to who this stain is most obvious. So, like I say, he could have not had a social media and he would have still won this election. But then, he would not have the new Narendra Modi which you see today. Yes? Uh, I'm interested in that. I have to hear a little bit more about that, the kind of methodological openings you see in this. Because this, to me, is a, um, the kind of readings that you're doing uh, of uh, this stream of media really requires uh, humans with contextual knowledge uh, yes. To be able to pull out really detailed and interesting messages. Is that your acknowledgments there? Yes, these are all the students yeah. who worked yeah. on this. Uh, so the question, so for me, this, the, 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 the way to kill that is to give it to a bunch of data scientists. Yes. Um, and so that's, but that's also the promise of we want to be able to do this in larger forms and for more places. So can you talk a little bit more yes. about that? Yes. So one of the things that we're trying to do with data scientists is to say that, let's say you have 6,000 of his tweets already hand-coded. Could you use the first 2,000 to then look at the level of accuracy in finding those themes in the next 4,000? That's one way of one data, uh, one new way of looking at the data that you could open up. The second way of looking at that, this data was, uh, so at Stanford, uh, there is this group working on, on crowdsourcing research, which is uh, not, so using some form of crowd, not for um, uh, routine activities, but for activities which require a certain amount of contextual knowledge. 
and using them to be trainers for some kind of small uh, text data. So that kind of crowdsourcing where you double up a lot of examples of, uh, of well, this is what the machine would have tweeted this as, what would have uh, uh, categorized this as, okay? Based on what the humans earlier had uh, categorized this as. Here is a starting point for you to think about whether you want to say, yes, this is correct, or no, you want to add something else to it, okay? I think personally that for most political actors like Narendra Modi, the human system of doing it is not only the best, but is also totally viable. Because you're looking at one person who has 10,000 tweets and a person who is going to be elected the prime minister of a country. If you're doing Donald Trump, you can just sit and uh, figure out a team to, to, yeah, it's not necessary to have a machine do it for that. But yeah, when you want to go beyond that to say, well, when he says something, how does that reverberate through the Twitter unit? That's where the new ways of thinking are going to be necessary. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We can continue. Yeah. We have reception outside. Let's uh, welcome everyone. Thank you.